Goeiedag en hartelijk welkom bij Regheid met Robinson hier op Litnet. Ons wens ons kijkers een voorspoedige en gezonde jaar toe. Maar ongelukkig staar die mensdom nou die grootste openbare gezondheidsnoodtoestand in die moderne geschiedenis in die gezicht. Bij die 40 landen het al begin met massa inentings van instoffen. Maar zit Afrika het nog niet in zekerheid van wanneer en hoeveel instoffen hij van internationale producenten zal krijgen. Nie. Die vakverbond Kusatus sê regheid. De minister van Gezondheid, William Kies, was aan die slaap en het versuim om de tijd Zuid-Afrikaanse internationale bestelling te plaatsen. Een groep van tien voorste gezondheidswetenschappelijkers beschuldigde de regering in een streamende verklaring daarvan dat hij geen plan heeft voor die verkrijging, verspreiding en inenting van vaccines nie. Hier versuim gaan leid tot die grootste mensgemaakte crisis sinds die vigspandemie waar tijdens honderden duizenden mensen dood is. De minister en zijn departement verwerpt die kritiek en zei een goede vordering wordt gemaakt in die onderhandelingen met instofverschaffers. Dit is al eens dat twee derde van de bevolking of meer dan 40 miljoen mensen die in het einde van het jaar ingeënt zal wees, beginnende in april. Een van die omgekrapte wetenschappelijke is de president en hoofdbestuurder van de Medische Navorsingsraad, professor Glenda Gray. Professor, welkom. Shall we say wishful thinking for the government's plan? Well, I think we have to move rapidly ahead and um, you can be strategic in the way to gain um, the most um, gain from your vaccine approach. And so uh, I think that we do need to get to 60% of the population and I think we can be strategic about how we do it. Uh, we can first go for healthcare workers and give them the jab and then move on to elderly people and people with comorbidities. The people that least need the vaccine should be the people that get it last, which is the people that are under 18 years of age. And so if we take a strategic approach and we roll out rapidly and we use all hands on deck um, and use public-private partnerships, we should be able to rapidly scale up. We need to learn from other countries, even poor countries like Kenya, Mexico and Colombia to see what how they did it. And we need to look at how the West did it. So I do think that we have to rapidly scale up vaccinations. And that if we do it in a strategic way, um, we can get the most bang for our buck. Now, do you personally believe also that the government has been uh, very slow in taking up this challenge? I think the government has been slow in taking up this challenge. I think that there's been a lot of mixed messages. And I think that uh, the minister um, uh, has not been, been supported adequately in, um, in trying to procure uh, vaccines for this country. So I do believe that, um, um, uh, the, that we should have worked harder and we should, been, we should have been in a better position um, in terms of procuring vaccines than we are at the moment. Well, you mentioned uh, the priority and people under 18 and uh, so forth. So that is part of the three-step program that the government has. Do you have any problem with that program, with that strategy, the three-step strategy? The three-step strategy is important, but what was missing from the three-step strategy was the timelines in able to achieve those three-step strategy. Um, if, you, if you want to immunize 67% um, of the population, it works out to be about 150,000 people a day, uh, which is um, an ambitious uh, strategy. And we only can do that kind of thing if we have everybody um, in this country working together to do mass rollout. And so I think what you need to do is be strategic and make sure you go for the areas of um, a vaccination program that will one, have the most public um, health benefits and two, the most individual health benefits. So basically what we wanna do is prevent death and dying and we wanna prevent um, hospitals filling up. And so to do that, we need to have a target approach and make sure we saturate the most vulnerable um, in, our, in our country and also the people who are essential frontline workers, like doctors, nurses, lab workers, uh, teachers, uh, policemen, and people at home affairs. So we do need to have a strategic approach. But all of these people are in the workplace. They're in the workforce. We can find them. And so it should be easy uh, to, to roll out a strategy as long as you're working with everybody in the country and everybody is pulling together. Well, you mentioned a timeline, but there is a timeline. The minister announced that actually he wants to inoculate some 67% of the people by the end of this year. Do you think it's possible? Well, I think that's 150,000 people a day. And if he wants to achieve that, then he needs to work with a whole lot of people to achieve this. We can work with Gift of the Givers, the Red Cross, 
uh, MSF, the medical aids, we can work with pick and pay, we can work with Coca-Cola, we can work with Diskim and Kix. Um, we can employ a whole lot of, of people uh, to, to, to roll out an ambitious program. It's very ambitious. Um, and I think that uh, um, to achieve it, uh, we should have already been started. We should have already have started um, on the 1st of January. So what went wrong? Well, I think that um, the negotiate, I mean, it's, it's very vague. I don't think I can, I'm not part of the government, but from what I can read from the out, out, out side is that um, the negotiations that they've had have not been concluded and they haven't been concluded either because um, uh, 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 we weren't uh, swift enough from the South African side and that we weren't um, desperate enough from the South African side to, to, to push through uh, bilateral agreements or to push through um, a, a better deal with COVAX or even to speak to other countries like Canada. Canada has five to 10 times more vaccine than it needs. Um, we could have phoned, picked up the phone and spoken to the minister um, the health minister in Canada or the, the, the prime minister of Canada. So I do think that where there's a will, there's a way. And that if we, if other countries in Africa and in Latin America who are as, who are as poor as us or even poorer have managed, like Venezuela and Mexico have managed to, to negotiate and navigate vaccine access in so, so early in the day, um, it me leaves us wondering what happened in South Africa. But we are part of the COVAX initiative by the World Health Organization. Was that not? We good? are part of it. COVAX was never ever going to give us the the number of vaccines that we needed, and I think they only ever promised between um, five and twenty percent uh, vaccine access to to countries. Also, the COVAX um, is a social solidarity program in that um, we get we don't get. Um, vaccine at cost, we get vaccine at the same kind of prices that the, as the US will, will get. So basically, um, we would get um, a, a vaccine price that is that subsidizes the poorer countries. And so we would find ourselves in a position um, as paying more for the vaccine than say Nigeria um, or India. You're talking about cost there. Is, is part of the problem the fact that uh, we are poor ourselves these days, um, or that we are in a desperate financial situation? Well, I think you have to look at the cost effectiveness of a vaccine program. Um, you look at the cost of ventilation, the cost of ICU admission, the cost of hospital care. And, you know, that soon uh, per, per person, you know, has astronomical um, um, amounts that it costs the, the government to run ICUs. Um, we know that, um, that for $10 a a, a shot uh, is what Pfizer is offering it us for. Ten dollars a shot. That's that's twenty dollars for a healthcare worker. Uh, we know that we spend ten dollars a month um, paying for antiretroviral therapy for uh, for people who are HIV infected in this country without batting an eyelid. And so um, it seems that we can afford it, and it is cost effective, and that that these costs are not prohibitive. These costs will prevent hospital admissions, these costs will prevent um, ventilation, and these costs will prevent um, death. So in the long run, um, it, it is affordable and is cost effective because it will save lives and ease the strain on hospitals. Well, you've mentioned um, the fact that there must be a strategy of rollout, but what does that entail in practice? Just give us a picture of what exactly must happen in practice. Okay, well, first of all, we have to um, procure the vaccine and we have to procure the, the doses of the vaccine. Um, and once we have it, uh, we have to, we have to ha manage a sophisticated uh, logistic um, dispensing scheme. And um, for the healthcare workers, that's going to be pretty easy uh, because we, we, have, um, we know where they are. Uh, we know where the hospitals are. We know where the primary healthcare clinics are. And uh, we can use the National Health Laboratory system to get to the more rural parts of the country. And so wherever there's a workplace, wherever there are workers in a workplace, um, you can deploy people to immunize um, uh, healthcare workers or, or frontline workers. And so, so I can't see any logistical nightmare or fiasco for, for people who, that are in the workplace. It becomes more tricky when you're trying to get to elderly people and people who are in more rural communities. But we also know that we could use the post office or SASA. We know what we know where every pensioner is because we pay them. 
and we could use and leverage um, the, the, the queues at pension payouts to deliver the vaccine using healthcare workers. I just want to come back to something that you mentioned earlier, and that is uh, the negotiations um, that were started apparently by government in September last year, uh, but we haven't secured our supplies from international bodies or companies. And the minister said the reason for that is he could not actually put down a deposit uh, when he was not sure that the, the vaccines would be effective. Is that, uh, do you think, a plausible argument? Well, I think that uh, uh, deposits are refundable. And in terms of your um, agreement with a pharmaceutical company, I think they're all reasonable. They're not going to take your money and, and run, particularly if you're a poor country. You can negotiate. So even if you had to put a deposit down, um, if the vaccine didn't work, um, no, no company uh, will keep the money, uh, particularly if you have a good, tight legal agreement. We also know that um, a lot of the, the the development, clinical development of these vaccines were, were fueled by the public purse and that Operation Warp Speed and Barter um, spent uh, you know, more than $500 million supporting um, the Big Pharma to, to develop these vaccines. And so Big Pharma hasn't had to uh, really pay out of its own pocket. Besides Pfizer and maybe a little bit of J&J, &J, a lot of these companies um, have been funded by the public purse. And so it's not exa exactly that um, that uh, uh, these pharmaceutical companies would hold your money back and, and not return it, or even you didn't, even wouldn't have to even give them the, vac the money. You could put it in a holding account or a trust account and have a legal agreement that they can access it uh, once the vaccine works. So there are ways, there are, must be legal and financial ways to, to protect uh, public money um, from pharmaceutical companies. Do you think there is some truth in the argument that um, in government and in other places like the Chief Justice, Mohueng Mohueng, are on principle actually against taking vaccines? Well, that would be very sad because we know that the only way to control an epidemic is through vaccination. We've only been able to control measles, smallpox, polio uh, with use of vaccination. We know that SARS-CoV-2 is as infectious, if not more than measles or influenza. And that um, the only way you can control um, onward transmission is through a vaccine. So we have we have hundreds of years of experience about how the value of, of vaccination programs and how they control epidemics and pandemics. And so um, thinking that um, a vaccine um, is not a silver bullet uh, is, um, is, is not a good thing because we know that's the only silver bullet that we have. But talking about a silver bullet, uh, you took actually some kind of affront to that kind of statement made by, I understand, the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Uh, and you were desperately, as you scientists, uh, against that. Well, I've seen the value of vaccines and I've seen how they've saved children's lives. I've seen the value of a pneumococcal vaccine, uh, of a meningococcal vaccine. I've seen the value of, of, um, of um, respir respiratory syncytial virus vaccine and of rotavirus. So I've seen how vaccines have changed the lives of children. I've seen how vaccines have reduced the mortality, under five mortality and infant mortality rate in our country and in the rest of Africa. So I've seen the value firsthand as a, as a young pediatrician growing up, um, seen the introduction of these vaccines, I've seen how they've changed lives. So it's very hard for me to understand um, why people would be so adverse to an intervention that um, first of all will stop someone going to hospital and second of all, we'll stop a grandparent from dying of COVID. Okay, were you, do you believe that they were the members of that advisory committee, that they were muzzled to, to extent, not to openly say in public that they are supportive of a massive program? It's hard to say. Um, I guess the ministerial advisory committee um, has a terms of reference and um, they uh, get requested to submit advisories on certain topics. And, um, and, uh, and from what I've learned about ministerial advisory committees is that you can give advice to the government and the government can decide to, to take up that advice or not. And so the job of the advisory committee is to, is to submit the advisories and it's the job of the government to read the advisories and make recommendations based on that. Did you have any response from government after that uh, statement that you've made in public? Uh, and do you believe that they want to muzzle you? 
So I um, I have had no response from the government on um, on the the op-ed that we did, and um, I've had no indication that um, there's any desire to muzzle me or to stop us from talking about um, the role of vaccination in South Africa. So at this moment in time, um, I haven't um, had any indication then that um, what I've said um, has um, irked anybody in government. But you personally feel that this situation has not been handled as it should have been. Is that true? Yes. I mean, I personally feel that uh, we do have an intervention that can help control the epidemic in our country. Um, and that intervention is affordable. And um, we've known for a while that some of these vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine is effective. And I do feel that we should have done everything in our power to get these vac this vaccine, particularly the AstraZeneca vaccine registered in our country and rolled out so that we could protect our healthcare workers. So I do believe that there's been a slowness to respond to amazing um, data coming out of the vaccine trials showing a wonderful um, e um, effectiveness. And I do believe that um, as countries, you know, South Africa was involved in the AstraZeneca study, we have wonderful experience um, in clinical trials from these um, vaccines. And so we are in a wonderful opportunity our regulatory authority understands these vaccines. The clinicians understand that we've used it in our country. And so there should be no reason uh, why we can't fast track um, these decisions, at least for our healthcare workers. If we could, we could vaccinate a million healthcare workers in the country in the next six, six to seven weeks, that would be an amazing feat. It would show solidarity. These poor healthcare workers have been working day and night, sometimes with in inappropriate and inadequate PPE. Um, they have mental health issues, they have trauma, they've watched their colleagues die. So in terms of solidarity and, and showing that we care about our healthcare workers, I think the least thing we could have done is to at least administer um, health, uh, healthcare workers with uh, vaccines and, and use the AstraZeneca program and got this rapidly registered in our country. Do you believe that the work that was done concerning research into the AIDS pandemic, uh, that it actually assisted now in the process of developing vaccines for this COVID-19? If it wasn't for all the um, development in HIV vaccines, we would not have a vaccine for Ebola, we would not have a vaccine for Zika, and we would not have a vaccine for COVID. So all the, the platforms that have been used, or most of the platforms that have been used, um, have been adapted uh, from the work that has been done in HIV vaccine development. And so a lot of the platforms um, are robust. We know them. We've used them in, in, in other diseases. And so, um, so using these platforms as a basis to make a COVID-19 vaccine um, was immediately translatable. And it's because uh, of the huge investment um, at a global level for, um, on HIV vaccines. Well, the latest news from the UK is that uh, they are in permanent, or, well, not permanent, but they're going to be in lockdown for in the next few months. Uh, and they say that um, one of the biggest problems is a virus from South Africa, a, st a different strain here, and it's very dangerous. And that is one of their biggest problems at the moment. Do you believe that? So there are two variants that are circulating um, um, in South Africa and in the UK. Our variant is distinct from the variant in the U in UK. And so um, although they may have similar mutations, they are two distinct. These two variants are largely circulating. Um, our variant in South Africa um, is, is becoming the dominant variant in South Africa. And, um, and there, is, there is evidence that um, there, there are some similarities between our variant and the one in the UK. Having tested more, what we call more catchy, more contagious, more transmissible. And we're not yet sure whether it's more dangerous in terms of severity of disease. And we're also looking to see whether this new variant will impact on the efficacy of the, um, um, as, um, on, on this. As we knew about the new variant, a group of, of scientists uh, got together and they've developed a, a strategy to quickly answer all the questions around how severe it is, how transmissible it is, and what impact this will have on vaccine efficacy. Well, that is, is one of the concerns, isn't it? That uh, 
vaccines that were developed already might not be useful for this particular virus variant. So we don't have reason to believe that, and we are obviously um, generating the data. So um, we have to, this, every, all our decisions have to be data driven. And so as we speak, we're sharing samples at a global level. We, we're looking at, at three infections, we're sequencing the virus, and we're looking to see whether there's any impact this, um, of this variant on vaccine efficacy. Um, we are very, we are fortunate, or maybe maybe not so fortunate, to roll out the the, vac the A26 efficacy study in South Africa at the time of the surge, and so we'll be able to evaluate whether our vaccine efficacy is different to what happened in Latin America or in the USA, and so um, we can really answer those questions in the next couple of weeks. And um, and scientists are working furiously around this. As I've mentioned before, we've we've had uh, uh, contact and communication with 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 Johnson and Johnson. We are sharing um, uh, uh, samples to make sure we can answer that question and deliver that information both to the scientific community and to our regulatory authorities. The minister has announced already that um, he would prefer the state to do all the procurement of vaccines, but the private sector must help in subsidizing uh, the cost. Do you think this is the right approach? I think we need a public-private partnership and we need a vaccine strategy that has equity in and is fair. And um, we need to work with both the public, with the public sector and the private sector to make sure that, um, that we have a fair allocation of vaccines. We don't want to be in a situation where where people jump the queue, or um, or that people who who are not at on top of the list get vaccine earlier because they're politicians or because they're rich, and so what we need to have is the the values of Ubuntu um, and fairness, and make sure that when we roll out our vaccine, um, we go to the people who need it the most first, and then get go to the and the last who, last to get it should be the ones who who um, um, are least affected by, by COVID-19, and that would be uh, children um, under, under 18. So, you know, so my, 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 my idea around the public-private partnership is to make sure that there's a, a transparent and equitable and fair way of allocating vaccines in our country. Okay, just coming back to another point, um, there's a, actually a kind of fight that's going to take place in court uh, about the information on the government strategy to actually force the government to have more information available. Do you personally also believe that there should be more transparency, transparency in the process of actually developing a strategy? Of course, um, you know, we need to trust our government and we need to, to engage with our government and we need to, to um, ensure that the government is accountable to its citizens and the people who live in it. And so I do, I do believe that um, there should be no reason to hide your strategy away and that there should be no reason not to be transparent and there should be no reason not to trust your citizens um, with this kind of information. Do you believe that uh, local manufacturers uh, in the pharmaceutical industry might be in a position actually to help to produce some of the stuff and thereby bringing down the cost and the availability. I do believe that. I think that South Africa has amazing uh, uh, manufacturing capability and has amazing science and people who can, can rise to the occasion. We have good generic drug companies. We can do fill and finish. Uh, tech transfer uh, can be done. So I do believe that um, South Africa, um, both in uh, the private sector in South Africa, um, can help the country um, do the tech transfer do fill and finish and help with vaccine um, um, uh, finish uh, labeling and distribution. What do you think must happen now? Well, I think what must happen now is that we need to urgently procure vaccines for our healthcare workers. So that should be our priority uh, this, this month and that we should be able to um, distribute uh, vaccines to our healthcare workers by the end of the month. So if I could say anything, I would say that uh, target your healthcare workers, get those a million doses into the country, give it to the healthcare workers to protect them and to show that we value their contribution uh, to the fight against COVID-19. 
And so that, that is what I would do in the first instance. I would go and procure a million doses for my healthcare workers. Well, I've read your statement that um, you released on Sunday, I think it was, um, and it's fairly scathing of government efforts and so on. So what do you think is the effect of that on your ability to work with government um, or is, is, is it a difficult situation for you? No, I mean, I think what we, what, what uh, the aim of our, our op-ed was to, to demonstrate that there were enough, there were scientists in the country that were concerned uh, about the, um, the ambigu ambigu how ambiguous the, the government was around uh, vaccine um, acquisition. We were concerned that the week before um, our op-ed came out, government was saying that vaccine was not a silver bullet. And we, we, were, we felt that they were giving mixed messages to the, to the, the country. We also felt that um, the, the country needed to know uh, that, that uh, we should have, we should expect a vaccine rollout strategy from the government. And we should, we have a right to expect volumes to flow, volumes of doses of vaccine to flow into our country, given the fact that there are uh, already um, vaccines that have demonstrated efficacy. And that uh, I, I saw people, healthcare workers in South Africa crying when they saw pictures of doctors and nurses getting vaccines in the UK. And I'm feeling really emotional about the fact that they were here uh, facing this, this onslaught of, of, of an epidemic um, with 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 um, without uh, vaccine, and they did, had no they had no idea when they would get it, and so um, I've also seen healthcare workers die, um, and nurses die, and doctors die in you know in in the last couple of months, and so for me as a healthcare worker, even though I'm not on the front line, I feel it's my duty to uh, try and make sure that we agitate to get vaccines first and foremost to our healthcare workers because they deserve it. They've been working incredibly hard. There's terrible morale, their mental health issues, um, and I think they deserve um, the, the vaccine um, because they have worked so hard. Uh, they see terrible things, they have to make terrible decisions, and they're very vulnerable. And I think the least that we can do as a country is to give our healthcare workers uh, a vaccine. Well, you are a health professional in your own right, and therefore, obviously, you can make statements in public and so on. But what is the council, your council, research council, actually doing uh, concerning this whole pandemic? Well, I think that um, as, a, as a science council, it's our duty. So the mission and objectives of, my, of the science council is to um, fund and conduct research that changes the lives of South Africans and to make sure that we translate our knowledge into, into action and policy. Um, it is no use um, running a science council and knowing that vaccines work and not make sure you go the last mile and make it available in your country. As scientists who are involved in, in vaccine research, it's our job not only to do the science and find the results, but to make sure that we, we implement policy and practice. Um, otherwise, our research would have been in vain. And so one of the objectives of the Science Council is knowledge translation. And so as the president of the South African Medical Research Council, I need to translate knowledge into practice. And if I don't, I would not be doing my duty. Are you personally involved um, with any kind of specific project uh, or in the interaction with government? Well, I was fortunate enough to, to be um, one of the national investigators for the A26 J&J study. And so I was fortunate enough to, to oversee um, 32 sites in South Africa that enrolled in this trial. And um, uh, I have been able to interact with the regulators and to share information. And so uh, my, my contribution to COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, um, development has been to, to run a, a efficacy study in the country and to make sure we deliver results that can be used for registration if, if our data, if our team is shown to be efficacious. Now, just in closing, do you think our lives will ever be the same? I hope one day our lives will be the same. 
And our lives will be the same if we implement the tools that are given to us. Our lives will, will come back to normal um, once we are able to roll out not only vaccines, but therapeutics as well, monoclonal antibodies and antiviral treatments that will help uh, treat uh, COVID-19 as well. Um, our lives will be normal when we are able to uh, vaccinate um, the world and um, get back to normal. But this won't be the first threat. You know, we, we will have many more threats like this and we will have to find a way of doing surveillance um, and um, rapid assessments and management of future pandemics to come. And so this is the first taste um, of a pandemic and if we're not careful, uh, we'll be repeating this um, in, in, in a decade's time. Thank you very much uh, for speaking to us this afternoon of this. We are very grateful. Thank you. Go well. Thank you very much. Thanks.